Hi, I'm Kara, content creator and Facebook wrangler for Amico Brent, bringing you ideas and support for your creative adventures every day. This week's episode is brought to you by Amico Brent. Find your favorite Amico glaze at your local distributor. Happy glazing! Today's episode is brought to you by the Rosenfeld Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. The collection exists as an online resource for research and inspiration, featuring photos of thousands of objects made by over 800 artists. The images are high quality and can be used with no permission required, making them a great resource for students and teachers. To find out more, visit RosenfieldCollection.com. Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 451 of the podcast. Thank you all for tuning in. Today on the show, I'm talking with Joey Quinones. They use fibers and ceramics in their mixed media sculpture to highlight the domestic and cultural histories of African and Caribbean Americans. In our interview, we talk about the influence of their career as an English professor, as well as the role of art in understanding identity and the work that they made while in residence at the Kohler factory. To see examples of their work, you can check them out on Instagram at jquinones underscore art. Also, I wanted to mention that Ensika will be hosting their first ever podcast room at this year's conference in Cincinnati. Thursday, March the 16th and Friday, March the 17th, there will be six hour-long live tapings of popular ceramic podcasts. I'll be hosting an episode Friday at 2.30 titled Taking an Environmental Approach to Making. That will be alongside Marianne Chenard from the Kiln Sitters podcast, and we'll be talking to guests Julia Galloway and Che Oshley from the Inseca Green Task Force. There will be Q&As at the end of all of these, and we encourage audience input, so please come and take part in this new interactive format for discussion at Inseca. If you'd like to find the details of that room, it's room 212 in the Conference Center, and you can find those in the program guide at inseca.net. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. So I thought actually that we would talk about your pre-clay or pre-fiber, pre, pre-art life when you were you got a PhD in English. So can you talk about your sort of passion for writing and how that started life? Yeah. So um it's kind of kind of interesting. Um I don't <laughs> I think when people think, "Oh, you got a PhD, right?" they think about this like vision, clarity, determination. Um, And uh, I have to say, my story is a a wee bit different, you know, working class kid. Um, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. My parents moved to New Jersey in the middle of high school and high school was a rough transition. And so I had always been in all the fancy classes and everything, but um, not a lot of uh, family sort of understanding of the college process and all that stuff. So, um, and at the time, really early on, um, my father was unemployed and chronically underemployed for a really long time. And um, I couldn't afford the college applications. And so I didn't tell anybody. And, you know, back then I didn't know anything about fee waivers or the process or, or just talk to somebody. So I just, you know, I had talked to my parents and my dad had just said, look, if you want to go to college, you have to figure out how to pay for that. And 
that was like this overwhelming shock, you know, of like, oh yeah, okay, right. I'd have to figure out how to pay for it. So I just assumed I wasn't going to college. And um, I just happened to have a guidance counselor. And, you know, I always laugh about my life. My life has taken one trajectory, but it totally could have gone another way. Cause I was just one of those kids that, you know, I liked my ceramics class, but I used to cut everything else. Cause I was super <laughs> bored and, you know, the principal would be like, you better not miss any more days. Cause I had missed like 22 days. And I was like, you know, so, um, it just, my guidance counselor just one day had just happened to say, I'm so glad you're at school today and you need to come downstairs because there's a recruiter from Rutgers. So you need to talk to them. And I was like, okay. So I went and talked to them and he, they were like, oh, you have great grades. I'm sure you applied to all these places and we'd like to offer you a scholarship. And just all you have to do is say yes. And I was like, yes. yes. <laughs> so it was random, right? It was super random. And then I ended up in college and I was like, oh, this is kind of fun, right? And like trying to explain to my parents, like they were like, why do you have to go live in the dorm? Right. It was like, you know, my mom had gone back and she had gotten an associate's degree, but she went to school and she came back and she went to school. She came back. So it was very different. Like this was a different world I was entering. And, you know, I was also one of those kids that had like four or five jobs while going to school full time because you're independent. Mommy and daddy are not paying for anything. You got to work hard. And uh, around sophomore year, a friend of mine said, um, <laughs> hey, you should go find out about this program because they pay you for the money in the summer. And I was like, oh yeah, that's great. So I was like, walked with her and I'm looking at the director and she goes, oh, so you're interested in graduate school. And I was like, yes, <laughs> yes, I am interested in graduate school. I had no idea what graduate school was. Like, you know, getting to college was a big enough deal that something after this uh and it turned out that uh the director was the director of the McNair program which is a federally funded a uh, trio program uh named after Ronald E McNair one of the uh astronauts that perished from the Challenger um incident and and um it was designed to prepare first generation low income minority students for graduate study and so they helped me and it was the first time that i was like wow, this isn't random, right? Like it was a group of people that were dedicated to making sure that students had quality information, feedback, support, um, so that your educational choices weren't random. Like I always think about it. Like if I had cut that day at school, I probably wouldn't have even thought about going to college. And I think the other thing that it really, um, it really stressed to me, like something to really take away was that there are thousands upon thousands of people who have the potential of going to school, completing advanced degrees, impacting the field, doing all of these things. And, and only because of the difficulty of navigating systems um, or getting quality information they don't have that chance to fulfill that potential. So, um, you know, I ended up, I didn't even, I went to graduate school because I was like, okay, I got to go to graduate school. And so I'm working on this PhD. And it wasn't really until like about the second year that I realized, you know, people were like, oh, you know, the job market. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and they were like, and then it dawned on me, I could teach college? with this degree, heck yeah, I'm going to finish this degree, you know, and, uh, you know, at the time, getting a English degree from the University of Iowa, they said the average amount of time was 10 years. And I went straight from a bachelor's to a PhD, which I wish I had a little bit more life experience, right? Because I think um, I love reading, you know, when I was in graduate school, it was really hard to convince me that this wasn't a giant scam, right? <laughs> like, they're going to pay me money to read books. <laughs> okay. You know, if, if, you know, for working class kids, this feels like a hustle, right? Because nothing is, nothing's given to you. So this just feels like a giant scam, you know? And I remember I had to ask one of my faculty, I was like, all right, you gotta, you gotta explain this to me. Like the college is 
paying my tuition and they're giving me teaching experience and it's got to be more than anything that I can contribute, right? And uh, I remember uh, Bluford Adams, my advisor, he said, uh, um, the amount that the college is giving you to complete this degree is nothing compared to the greater good you will be able to participate in. And I was like, oh my gosh, the greater good, right? Like, what a beautiful concept. And so, you know, all of a sudden, then it really becomes this thing. So it's, you know, definitely a passion for literature, but it was something that I was good at. I never really had to work hard for it because it just sort of came. Um, I mean, in a doctor, it's a lot of work, but, <laughs> but, you know, like, uh, it was education with this mission in mind of a greater social good. Um, and so really, I think what was more important to me was being an educator as opposed to like, you know, uh, I don't know, like an English person focused on a lot of like the research and the books and the, you know, I I was like, this is a chance to be an educator. And that stayed with me. And so I was fortunate that after I got my degree, I was able to establish two McNair programs, um, one at Minnesota State University, Mankato, and one at Earlham. So that's what I did for a really long time. Do you feel like that you could fulfill that greater good through teaching at the, the university level or teaching English at the university level? I did for a really long time. Um, yeah, and I was, you know, really fortunate, um, that I was at a small liberal arts institution, um, that for a really long time was really committed to, um, accepting students, admitting students, regardless of financial need. And it was a Quaker institution and that really resonated with me, um, and teaching people how to read or write, how to read and write felt like social justice, right? Um, then, and about, uh, about 2009, there was like a whole bunch of things that started happening, right? Um, just in terms of like race relations. Um, and I also got sick. I was diagnosed with breast cancer and, um, it took me a really long time to figure out, like, you know, you know, as an adult, as a parent, as part of a family, you know what you would die for, what you'd be willing to give it all up for, right? Uh, but I had to take a lot of time and figure out what would I live for? And it's it's a question that I don't think, um, you know, a lot of people of color or minority folks or working class folks get a chance to really ask. Like, I'm fortunate enough to be alive right now what is the thing that is so important to me that I want to wake up every day? And the surprising answer was art. <laughs> <laughs> I was completely floored. Uh, I was like, well, that's not a left field because you know <laughs> I had been a quilter for years and I loved quilting and I knew, you know, I always ran into problems with the quilt groups because they would be like, buy this pattern, buy this fabric, make this quilt. And I was incapable <laughs> of doing that, right? And, uh, you know, shortly after all that, I had a sabbatical. And um, my colleagues at Earlham, you know, uh, like Judy Wojcik and Nancy Taylor, they were, they were so generous about come on and sit in on class sit in on the ceramics class, sit in on the fibers class, sit in and see. And I loved it. I loved it. And, um, you know, I think then it sort of became, the visual became all of a sudden this different language and vocabulary that you can have where, you know, being in the classroom, I love being in the classroom. But then there are these things that you could make that are sort of the reflection of all your best thinking and all your hard work and that they can communicate with people larger than any classroom. 
And that to me has been, you know, really, really inspiring. You know, there's a saying, show, don't tell. Like that was something that in graduate school, a lot of people would say that in critiques, like just let the work show, show us, you don't have to tell us. But I think when you're communicating with a language through writing in English or through any, any verbal spoken language, I think sometimes language can be very linear and art can be very circular. And so there's this thing that happens when you take the same idea and translate it through an art medium that doesn't happen. There's more subtlety, there's more complexity, or at least this is my perspective than if you're writing something about it. So is that something, or how do you think about that now that you're fully working through material? You know, I just feel like um, as much as I love books, I love books, I love writing, I love reading. Um, I'm kind of also aware that we're in a very heavily visual time, right? Like this is a culture that is used to tons of images. And for me personally, the writing, you know, I think a lot of the times as I think of my sculptures as visual poems, right? They're, they're physical metaphors, right? Um, and so the writing component is still really important to me. Um, but the final product feels a little bit more, um, you know, accessible. Like, I think, you know, people are able to look at an image for 60 seconds and see something versus, you know, read the poem and then feel like, okay, 60 seconds, I might need to go back and look at that again. I think the other thing too, is this is from, you know, being an English professor. (laughs) (laughs) I think a lot of people, you know, we used to do a lot of research on reading and up until about the age of seven, um, children think of books as toys. And then after that, welcome, you know, welcome to our educational system. People don't think of those as toys anymore or things that they can encounter in any way that they want. And so I feel like a lot of the time, um, you know, sometimes with the written word, there's a little hesitation of participation that people feel that they have not been trained properly or they doubt their judgment, right? In terms of, did I understand that correctly? Maybe there's an answer that I don't know. I think there's a little bit of a freedom in in sort of the visual in that, you know, a person may look at my artwork and may not know, oh, that is from the 19th century and this is from France at, and, or this is a concept, but they know how it makes them feel. And you can trust what you see and you can trust how you feel. And so I think that's like an amazing, an amazing ability um, for me from the visual when you went back to school to get an MFA, how did you decide where you wanted to go? Because you really work, as I was researching you, you work in so many mediums. So what school attracted you? Right. So I work in a lot of mediums, but I guess, you know, part of it, I, I, I'm pretty happy. I feel like this has been a journey and I'm so delighted. And half of it is that I just didn't know. And, uh, which I think, you know, I knew how to get into graduate school, but I was really thankful. I think that, you know, I crashed all my colleagues' courses. There were no more courses for me to take. <laughs> like I had the equivalent and, you know, I couldn't get an official BFA um, because the school wasn't going to give me one. And I understand why. And probably after what I did, they'll never let anybody. <laughs> they were like we lost our English professor she went and got an art degree but um it was it was really interesting um so I had been a quilter and I was like that's something that I know you know um and my kids were still um in high school and so I was a mom and I'm super lim- you know super limited in um, geography. 
So like, you know, you look at the brochures and you're like, oh my God, maybe I could go to a place like Cranbrook, which would be amazing. But then, you know, you also are really realistic, right? Like I'm super realistic. Like I have all this training in one area, but, you know, I felt like while absolute freedom <laughs> might be wonderful, what if I really need a class, right? Like, cause I'm, I'm going into fibers, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. And so um, I looked at Indiana University Bloomington and I went there specifically to work with Roland Ricketts, um, but I was also really aware that Malcolm Mabutu Smith was there. Um, and I was like, classes, I need a long program. I need like three years, because I two years, you know, there's a lot of stuff that I need to catch up on. And so I think kind of the one blessing was that the the program was designed in such a way that you kind of went into the fibers program but as a graduate student you could kind of take and you could explore and I really needed that exploration so when a lot of people sort of come you know I think sometimes they come to an MFA program they go I'm a painter or I'm a ceramicist and I came in there going I'm a student like what do you got and so just the sheer joy, I mean, there's something about being a little older, going back, doing the graduate degree, um, you know, it's not so much of an existential crisis. Like, you know, I had to put my house for sale. My kids, you know, my sons had to stay with their dad and his wife. Like I had to change my whole life just for this opportunity to study and I couldn't be more joyful you know I was like bring bring it on I want to see everything I want to learn everything I want to try everything um and it was really helpful not to think of myself in a very narrow way right and so I spent a lot of time in graduate school cra crashing classes again I guess and people were like oh that's not how you do that and I was like yeah why and then, like <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> well, it brings up a good point. If you don't have a preconception about what a material is, you can bring creativity in a different way to that material. And I was got in touch with our mutual friend Heather Gray, and I was asking <laughs> her, like, okay, what 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 should I ask Joey? And 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 she said, well, she she's like a sponge; she can learn everything. <laughs> and. You're saying this now that like that your approach to learning is more, it seems more like what's the, what are the most things I can learn? And then I'll use them down the road. Not, I have this specific idea. I need to learn this specific technique and then go that way. It's, it's a quilter's philosophy. If you really think about it, right? Like you ask a quilter, why do you have so much fabric in your stash? <laughs> You're like, cause I'm going to use it one day. <laughs> right. <laughs> And so I really think of it as um, I want to be perpetually intellectually curious. Like, I want to be nosy. Like, you know, I still could remember this one student who was like long time ago. He's like, I'm not really good at writing. And I was like, well, what are you really good at? He's like, pig farming. And I was like, well, tell me all about pig farming. It was fascinating. I was like, you need to write your paper on pig farming because this is brilliant. Like I would never think of these things, you know? And so just really having the, that desire to be intellectually curious. Um, and I think what ended up happening is that I didn't necessarily fall in love with just one material, but I do love how material can convey time, place, space, history. And so I know that if there's a particular material or material combination that can help me express that poem, I'm going to learn it. Yeah, I want to give an example of that, actually. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm going to reference a show that you did or a body of work. Is it Lacuna? Is that how you say it? Yeah. yeah. First, can you explain what that word is and then talk about the different works that were in that show? Sure. So that was my MFA thesis show, 2019. And um, Lacuna is a gap in um, a manuscript or a book. It can also be a cavity or a depression in the bone. Um, and so I just loved, loved that idea 
because that thesis show was primarily um, focused on trying to figure out. So I, by training, I'm a 19th century Americanist. And I loved material culture of the 19th century, early 20th century. And um, I was really fascinated by the idea of the topsy-turvy doll, right? Just this doll, double-sided doll connected by the torso, one white, one black. Because, you know, there's no, pl there's no time in space that could develop an artifact like that except... This is this is like a visual manifestation of all the anxieties and all the racial concerns that people were having, right? So they make a child's toy that you flip its skirts over, <laughs> over its head, and you have one black side and one white side. And that's like such an apt metaphor for what was happening at that time period. And so I was really interested, like, what would a 21st century Black, queer, Afro-Puerto Rican <laughs> topsy-turvy doll look like? And I, you know, the more and more I thought about it, the more it felt like perpetually filling in the gaps, okay? Perpetually filling in the gaps, right? So it's like, um, you're black, but not quite black, right? Because you don't have a very like Afro, um, African American kind of experience, right? Um, so like, I don't have family that's in the South and I don't have family that moved through the great, great migration, you know, um, but the way that I grew up, where I grew up, my family, my family history is intimately tied with the transatlantic slave trade. So how do you start communicating those ideas of that gap, right? Um, definitely, you know, you're Puerto Rican. But not really, right? Were you born on the island? You know, so you could be both and neither. And that was the perpetual state that I just kept finding. Like you could be like both both Puerto Rican and not Puerto Rican. You could be a citizen, but not quite a citizen. You could be, you know, queer, uh, <laughs> but not really, you know. So it was, it, I think that's where, where that term, like I love that idea of, um, the missing part of the manuscript, right? And um, it really does feel like, you know, one of the things um, at a review, um, Malcolm was on my committee and um, I remember just kind of going on and on about like, oh yes, but you know, you would go into the, the churches and there's all these people, black and brown people going into these churches and none of the figures look like them. And he's like, well, what'd you make them look like? And I was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and, you know, but that idea that creativity and imagination can show you brief glimpses of the world of what it could be. And so, you know, thinking about as an artist, how can I start filling in those gaps in the absence of a real archive, right? So a lot of the things that I like to think about are making fake objects, <laughs> <laughs> that more accurately depict, right, the racial and gender um, dynamics and class dynamics, you know, um, because we have this material culture that really kind of one-sidedly tells a story. And so how do we go back and fill in the gaps? We're going to come back to a few pieces that are in that show, but I, I wanted to, this is a good transition to, there was, I think this was a Ceramics Monthly article where you talked about like who who's your someone asked you who's your work for and you said my work is for anyone who would ask these questions who is present and this is talking about history who is present who is missing and what is their story which is essentially what you're talking about with the archive you know like the american archiving has always been a white thing and the history is skewed towards white men and towards white people because they were the collectors of history so can you talk about this concept of looking to the past and living in a present that is more full, that is more real also? <laughs> because it was not that the people weren't there, it's just that the material culture wasn't saved. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm like, I had uh, <laughs> five thoughts that came in at the same time. Um, yeah, I mean, that's totally... That's totally it, right? Like 
this is why I'm like so excited about art making right now. And so I I perpetually want to be a student learning because what an exciting time because you have all of these different artists that are asking you, hey, have you ever really thought about how the past is is uh, ordering relationships in the present? I, I mean, I keep thinking about like I, I did a, a residency at the Winter Third Museum Garden and Library, which is great. They have an artist maker grant. And um, it was, you know, great. I got to to look at all these material objects, you know, and it's the largest collection of American decorative arts. And when I got there, I was thinking, well, of course, I'm going to find stuff from New Spain and I'm going to find stuff from Mexico and I'm going to find stuff from Latin America. And I didn't really find a lot of things. And a lot of it had to do with, you know, if you put an idea in your head and you say American, but what you really mean is the United States, then you're leaving out a large part of the story. And so, you know, I think about that a lot. Like there's a lot of, even the way that we approach study, um, these little kind of silos where we miss out a lot of the stuff that doesn't fit neatly in a box. And sometimes it's people, (laughs) right? Like, you know, I can't begin to tell you how many people um, know Puerto Rico, right? Puerto Rico is a place. It's, you know, I want to go there for vacation, but don't know Puerto Rico, right? Don't know the relationship of, of the island to the United States, you know? And I keep thinking about like, you know, as a, as a scholar and an academic, there's these amazing things that I find out and i'm like oh my god how do we keep how do we keep passing that information down you know like you know when um the spanish american war concluded right folks didn't really know what to do the government didn't really know what to do with people on the island and so some puerto ricans got sent to carlisle indian boarding school and some got sent to the to the, like you know the african american schools because they just didn't really know what to do right are are these like is this colonization so it has similarity with with indigenous people here or is this more about their race and this history so you know do we put them here right training for for african americans right where people don't know you know that like during the spanish american war african american soldiers like deserted and went and fought with the filipinos cuz they saw more in common <laughs> with the philippine people <laughs> than than the US. And so I think anything, like we need to have tons of people going back and saying, it's a larger story than this. It's a more sophisticated story than this. It's a more complex story than this. Like we, I think sometimes um, there's this flattening And, you know, when I think about like, who is my artwork for? And I'm kind of like, hey, anybody who's asking these questions, um, I tend to think a lot about, um, I think as a, as a person of color, minority, a black, black woman, it's so easy to fall into this habit of always talking to whiteness. And I think sometimes at the expense of not talking about the histories and the connections and the differences amongst all the different people of color. And so that's a real conversation that I feel like is worthwhile having. Um, You know, so you get these really weird moments in in the present that you kind of go, what? So wait a minute, there were Dominicans in New York that were protesting Black Lives Matter. And then there were Black people that were like, yeah, we want border control. And you're like, what? And so much of it is really having to investigate those histories of those different groups of people. And just because we come to a different place or we move to a different place doesn't mean we're not living out those histories. And so, you know, like, I'm very aware 
right? That like people want to put me in a category like, you know, are you black? Okay, if you're black, then you're this and you believe these things. And then if you're Latinx, then you're this. And I was like, but I really think of myself as Afro Latinx, like, I'm, you know, and even that is a loaded fraught term, right? Um, <laughs> but they're just, yeah, I'm just really interested in how do we talk about the complexity of each other's histories um and that you know i think about my understanding of the world was just as much impacted by the jones act of 1917 which made puerto ricans us citizens i'm just as much impacted and living out the legacy of brown versus board of education and so you know coming to the like being in the United States, being born and raised in the United States with this American history that you're living into and also this Puerto Rican history that you're taking with you, you know, it takes a lot of um, skill navigating. And I think art can help us tell those stories a little bit more complexly. Um, yeah, we need to be talking to each other. You know, we can't just assume, oh, you look like me. So you're going to automatically think like, there's a lot of work that I think black and brown people need to be doing too with just understanding each other. Like, you know, talking to whiteness is you know, okay, but that's just one part of the conversation, right? Like, you know, when people would ask me, oh, I'm going to a Mexican restaurant, what should I order? I was like, I don't know. First time I had a taco <laughs> while I was in college, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, and then people are confused, but you're Latina. And I was like, that is just a nonsense term somebody came up with a really <laughs> long time ago to just organize us, right? And so, you know, I, I'm always really curious about who's here, who's not here, because they were there. <laughs> and you're talking about complex issues of identity, but I think there's a visual complexity in your work that I see as a through line that goes when you're using multiple mediums. So like the way that you'll use fabric that's printed with very specific patterns that have meaning and relevance beside forms or things that reference doll parts, things that were really a reference to colonialism. Like those two things beside each other mean more than either of those things apart from each other. And that we know that. Like we know speaking through artistic language, that is the thing. But I'm I'm interested in how you specifically do that. So in in that show, the Lacuna show, there's a, a a sculpture called The Myth of the Return. And can you explain like physically what that looks like, but also the stratification of meaning between all the materials that are in that very large figure sculpture? Yes, I call her Big Mama. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that piece, um, that piece is 12 feet wide. It's big. It's about um, a little over six feet tall. So closer, I think about closer to seven feet. Um, it has um, a white face and torso and 17 black slip cast legs. Um, and so that piece um, is really, and then it has all the costuming and the fabrics. Um, that piece, um, I think that was one of the first pieces that I was kind of like, there's all these books, there's all these things I'm reading and I'm thinking about, I'm looking at, and then there's all these material objects that I'm looking at the archives, like looking at references. Um, but it was sort of the first time that I was able to really think about how do you how do you visualize an idea? And so there's this book, um, uh, C. Riley Snorton, um, Black on Both Sides, a trans history of the a black trans history of the United States. And I, I love this book. Um, and it, and in it, um, they they talk about racial fungibility. And so um and, and fungibility is like a, like a, I think we think about it a lot. It's an economic term. And it's basically like when you can have one thing and, and it'll stand in for another thing. So like cryptocurrency, right? Um, but they were talking about crypto, they were talking about racial fungibility in their, in their work. 
And there was a line that was basically like, you know, the tragedy of the transatlantic slave trade was this notion that one body could be completely replaced by another. And, you know, for me, like the weight of that, right, the dehumanization of, you know, this capitalist system is basically saying one body is as good as another one black body could be. And, you know, in the Caribbean, it was like cheaper to work somebody to death than, than try to maintain, you know, their bodies. And so for me, like, I just couldn't get over that amazing tragedy and sadness of that. And so how do you turn information like that into a series of aesthetic decisions? And, you know, uh, originally I had thought about, like, I wanted to just do fiber because I was comfortable with fiber, but I really thought like, you know, dolls, um, historically, the hands, the feet, the heads were cast um, and then shipped out and then people filled in the bodies. And that's how you were able to facilitate the mass production of dolls. And so um, I decided to kind of have a similar approach, the head and the, the feet, and they're all slip cast. Um, the torso is slip cast as well. Um, I was really fascinated by the whole mold making idea because it's a ridiculously labor intensive way <laughs> of going about something. But it was really important to me that this was labor intensive because it was a meditation on bodies, right? So, you know, um, I was doing life casting. So it's three different people's body parts that make up this one figure. And for me, that's like, yeah, one body could be filled in with another body, right? But there's something when you do life casting that's really tender because the person that's doing it is super vulnerable. Um, and you're getting to see all these details, you know, like little tiny scars and the little birthmark that's raised here. And, and it reminds you that they're human in the same way that all the black and white people of whatever period were human, you know. Um, and so, you know, I was funny. I was casting the face of one of my friends and, um, you know, she kind of looks at me and goes, oh, so am I going to be the villain? And I was like, oh my God, no, there's <laughs> got to be more, more complexity to the villain, right? Like, yeah, like even, you know, so even a woman, right, uh, that has sort of limited, limited opportunities, whether they were white or they were black, you know, they're still, it's still all opportunities still all operating in the system so and you know a lot of people ask me why does it have 17 legs and I was like because it's odd but in reality right you have all this pomp and elaborate costuming that's all on the top and then you see all these legs and people inevitably count the legs and then they realize by that mathematics it's like eight and a half people which then makes you start thinking about, well, that's not, how is that possible? Like, where are the people? And so for the first time, possibly you look at the things that we're very familiar with in terms of, of decor decorative arts, right? All the swirls and the twalls and the silks. And all of a sudden you're looking at all that and you're down there looking and saying, but what happened to those black bodies? And so those juxtapositions are really important. And like, you know, all the fabrics for that piece, I literally got them at like Joanne's fabrics, <laughs> right? So what does it mean that I can recreate historical moments with decorative motifs that we still have to, to furnish our homes that make people feel I have class? I have style. I have good taste, right? Sometimes I think people also think those are super tacky, right? Like the Rococo. But but it is still something that we easily have access to. And so, you know, so I'm very deliberate about putting the toile that usually has those pastoral scenes of like, you know, 
the and it's all very heterosexual you know the the man and the woman and they're frolicking or kissing or in the gardens and then the next thing you see visually are all those black legs and so those are all deliberate strategies and you know i'm not i'm not in any way saying that i can look back in the past and have all the answers I can look back at the past and say, oh my God, what a tangled mess. Because all these things are happening at the same time and I'm just asking questions. And so the fact that those questions exist means we we have a lot of work to do. Like we should also be asking those questions in the in the present, you know. How can we understand that like sexism is very real and yet impacts you know different women whether it's international women or domestically diverse women in academia differently like like we need a little bit more sophistication in our question asking therefore the juxtaposition of lots of things because I don't have the answers I just want to raise (laughs) questions (laughs) Well, I think I think questions have staying power in a way that answers don't, you know, because time changes and expectations change. And culturally, we give different answers at different times. But questions are almost, you know, I think they can live. They have a long, long shelf life. And one of the things that a lot of your work questions is about labor itself and about how black bodies in the past were used just as labor. It was not humanity. It was nothing but labor. And when I saw that piece, what I was thinking about is also feminine labor because you have um, the white body on top, but let's imagine you can't see the black legs and the dress is over that. And it's this massive hoop skirt and there's all this power to like move around all that pageantry. And I, and I just think about like the, uh, the, the idea of women's work, you know, like women's work is hard ass work, even when it's labeled women's work, (laughs) but you're pointing to kind of the, the, the cultural setup of all of that in the plantation era. And that I think really helps me to see like, oh yeah, it's still happening. Like you talk about it with academics. Um, you know, my wife is a history professor and her, the way she moves through academia has really opened my eyes to the way academia works and the labor involved in it. Right. Right. And I think too, like part of the story, you know, has been like, like I love, I, I'm I'm a, such a, an Octavia Butler fan. Like I love Kindred. It's like one of my favorite books, right? And the beauty of that is that, you know, she illustrates how much of the the way domestic life is structured, how that there's a, you know, but the way that the the patriarchy is set up, the way that the man teaches the boy how to treat the wife is intimately connected to how, you know, the white people versus black people that are working in the house versus the ones that are in the field, like that these structures, these power structures um, share some logics in common that are detrimental to everyone. And so, um, you know, I think a lot about so much of, of, of literature that deals with colonizations, right? Like, you know, turn turn of the century literature, that idea of the domestic and the home and the wife and the family and how important those ideas were. Um, and in a way they were complicit, right? With with spreading colonization and genocide and and enslavement worldwide. And so, you know, And I think, too, it's kind of weird, right, because there's also this tendency to believe that things that are associated with the home or associated with decoration or decorative are somehow, like, not worthy of our study or our time. But, like, going to the Winterthur and seeing all that mahogany furniture that was the craze and mahogany as a material that was indigenous to the Caribbean and led to the deforestation in the Caribbean, because everyone wants mahogany. It's a status marker, right? Um, And then that it's harvested by mostly enslaved people. So, 
you know, and I think part of the resistance to looking at things like the home or your China pattern or your, your wallpaper pattern, right? Like, oh no, it's not too serious. I think it's because if you start looking at all of those things closely, your view of the world and your faith in the stability of all the things that you think really matter will completely fall apart, but things can be rebuilt. And, and I think need to be rebuilt. You know, like one of the other things that I was wanted to talk to you about in general is the way that it, through your work, you have deconstructed your own identity and reconstructed it. Because I feel like this is an active process. And I, I don't know you personally, I don't know you outside of your art career, but I just have a feeling that that deconstruction and reconstruction is important. So can you talk about those ideas? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I think those ideas also kind of relate to my material usage. You know, so like this summer, um, I did a residency at Kohler and um, <laughs> and I started out in fibers, but I fell in love with clay. So, of course, I went to foundry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and I think a lot of it has to do with that, you know, um, having a sense of real sense of yourself as this really understanding of like being this hybrid amalgamation of a bunch of different ideas that shouldn't really be existing in one body, but they do, right? Like, you know, I could be Puerto Rican as Puerto Rican can be, but you're kind of dark, so maybe a little different. Or, you know, I could be um, as a good a mother and a good as a daughter, but you're you're queer, right? So, you know, and all of those things live within me, right? And so taking it down, I think, you know, um, in a piece like Big Mama, I was really trying to figure out historically, how did I get here, right? And then there's a piece um, that's called Dorotea, which has um, a face um, that's cut multiple times and it's three faces together. And then it has hands, ceramic hands with the ceramic slip cast apples, well, press mold apples. Um, and the hands are offering out the apples. And then the whole background is covered with, you know, fake silk roses. <laughs> and that was a piece that felt like an attempt to reconstruct, attempt to reconstruct identity. So, um, you know, I was, I grew up Catholic and I was always really influenced by that imagery. And so like Dorotea at the most basic level is my confirmation name, right? But it was like Dorothy of the Little Flowers, the martyr saint, um, you know, who was killed. Um, and, you know, it makes you think about like, oh, uh, all these martyrs who didn't want to get married. <laughs> Were they all queer folks? <laughs> right. <laughs> And, and, you know, and then in my family, there was always this like, oh, yes, we're all Catholic. We have the altar to the Virgin Mary, but we also have the little altar to Allegua in the, in the bedroom too, right? And so to have the, the cowrie shells. So it was interesting. So no one, you know, overtly would talk about, isn't it fascinating how our family has this retention to, to an African syncretic religion? You know, nobody's going to say that, but that's the way we lived, right? And, and so I wanted to mix sort of the, the Catholic imagery with the, with the, you know, imagery of Santeria in my home. Um, and it also feels like, you know, whenever you have these really great big upheavals or changes in your life, it feels like dying. And, um, you know, when I was a kid, we would, we would go and get the fake flowers to put in the cemetery because they would last longer. Right. Uh, and so I just couldn't get away of that feeling of all those silk flowers, right. All those, all those people. And, you know, you put it all together and, you know, I don't even think it matters that people maybe understand it, but hopefully there's this feeling of, um, 
This is the reconstructed self, right? After the fire, what is left? And this is the bits and pieces that I'm holding on to and making something of. And it's such a human process. You know, like I, I think I think the self is already always changing. You know, like it, it, I've been involved with meditation in a long time and a lot of my Buddhist teachers talk about that the self, as soon as you feel like you can grasp it, it's like water through your hands. But it does not mean that it's not important that you figure out what it is. It just means that as soon as you figure it out, it's going to change. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's something that I was, I always knew as an avid reader, right? The th- You could read the same exact book at 18, read it again at 27, read it again at 47, and your responses to it will change completely. And the book hasn't changed, but it's you, right? So like I would read Keisha Pan's The Awakening. And when I was 18, I was like, yeah, Edna, go walk into the sea. And then 27, I had my first child. I was like, mm. <laughs> maybe not so much. But then, you know, you I read it again not too long ago. And I was like, man, how difficult it was to be brave enough to be the artist, right? That she had an artist's soul and the whole world told her, you're a wife and a mother. So you don't, you know. It's kind of exciting to think about, you know, it's not frightening, it's not fixed, it's moving, but, you know, you get to rediscover yourself and everyone around you that you love, and that's pretty cool. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about Kohler, mainly that, that foundry work is is so different in that you you can touch some of the material, but you cannot touch hot molten metal. You know, like it is a dangerous thing. And there's this great video of you working in, in the factory and they're they're following <laughs> you around different places. And I swear half that video is you pushing heavy carts worth of <laughs> of those burnout molds. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And you know, they were filming that and there's this whole crew there. And I was like, a little help here anytime. <laughs> well, yeah, it was heavy. But I think the the this is like, you know, the excitement of of trying out new things. So much of the stuff that I was able to make, I was sculpting it in clay. And that was like, that was like, oh yeah, this is great. So, you know, um, we were doing basically a resin bonded sand mold process and we were able to cast in brass and cast in iron. And basically, you know, you're making patterns and your patterns could be almost any material as long as you could take it out. So I experimented a little with silicone and, you know, um, or objects actually, you know, making replicas of objects and or trying to make waxes. But the most wonderful thing was that I was able to do those things in clay. And so, and you don't have to worry about firing it. Nothing blows up. It's like, ah, it's great. No, things don't blow up anymore, but... <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, so it was like, I think for me, it just helped clarify that like nothing is wasted, right? All those things that you learned in the past are skills that then you have that then can come back and help you in really unexpected ways. And so, you know, I go over there and I'm, I'm working in clay. The final product might end up being, you know, brass or iron, but I'm doing stuff in clay. There, there's an image, um, still life to Black Peter. Is that the name of the the piece? Yes. Can you tell me about the materials that are in that? Is that all bronze? That's all brass. Brass. Sorry. Yeah. How did you surface it? Because it is the most seductive waxy surface. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> okay. So yeah. <laughs> And this is part of, you know, I think sometimes people think that I'm, I'm like being disrespectful or something, but really I'll just use whatever gets me to point, like from point A to point B. And so, um, there is a little bit of fiber. There is a little bit of Dutch wax print and some lace, but the, the face is chalkboard spray paint and all the color in there is spray paint. And the only thing I didn't spray paint was the 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 I cast I cast a um a doily a giant doily on top of a silver tray and that's like the one thing that I didn't touch but I spray painted 
I did that as a finish. It's an amazing surface, but tell us about that piece, about what the objects are and, and the meaning behind that. So Still Life to Black Peter, um, really sort of, you know, I'm doing all these processes and I, I love the figure. Um, and so, you know, I'm also at, at the residency really trying to figure out oh, how do I make meaning with a material that I'm not familiar with? So I was doing a whole bunch of, of, of research um, and experimenting, but for that piece in particular, I think um, it centered when I'd love to go antique shopping. So I went, you know, to the local area and was looking for a few antiques and I found a um, candy, a chocolate mold. And it was um, an old little um, candy mold and it had Black Peter on it. And so Black Pete, and so in the Netherlands, they have this um, tradition of Santa's little helper, who was a black man. And there's a lot of controversy, right? Because people are like, it's our tradition, or it's just black suit. Like, it's not, he's not really black. It's just, he, you know, got suit on his face. And, and like, people will dress up like Black Pete. Um, and so it's like, really this fascinating thing and then you know it that little chocolate tin candy tin kind of reminded me of like the history of the dutch um you know the things that we think of like the still life um uh, and we'll think of it as the dutch golden age i mean that's that's the transatlantic slave trade right that's where that's coming from so you know you had tulip mania so i was able to cast um silk um, flowers. And so those are made out of brass. Uh, and so all the items I think are, you know, related to kind of like the influence of, of the Dutch. And it's a still life where I wanted the face to be partially obscured, but that, you know, there were real consequences, um, for, for Africans and, and black people in terms of all the things that artistically we sort of credit the Dutch for. And so like um, the thing that we think of as as African fabrics, Dutch wax prints, were actually um, copies of, of batiks that were meant for the Indonesian kind of market that were not successful and then got traded um, to parts of West Africa where in the 1880s it took off. And so, you know, the thing that we sort of think of as the stand in for Africanness is actually a European <laughs> commodity that didn't work for one market, but was adapted to another. And so all of those things, the objects on there, you know, so some of the the Caribbean tropical fruits, um, alluding to the Dutch, um, the, the Dutch holdings in the Caribbean. Um, and so it's sort of a still life of all of that stuff, but with a very soft, sort of tender looking boy on, on the piece. So it just was like just one of these moments where um, it's a little snapshot into a really complicated history that we're still living. Well, I think like like much of your work, it's pointing to other bigger things, you know, and, and I really like that. I like that once I saw that, I'm like, what? Okay. I got to do some research here. <laughs> what, <laughs> what does this does this mean? And thankfully, I got to talk to you today and just ask you. <laughs> but to wrap up, can you leave both the information about people that would potentially want to come study with you at Alfred, and then also um, your uh, Instagram or any your website, so people could get in touch? Sure. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So, um, sculpture department accepting applications. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I have a delightful, delightful group of colleagues. I mean, we're really big for a sculpture program. Um, so we have glass casting, glass blowing, neon. Oh, I know I'm forgetting somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> Fibers me. We have electronics. We have wood shops. Oh, and we have foundry, coral, right? So it's foundry work. Um, and our graduate students are in close proximity with the ceramics 
um, grad students. And so some of our students are actually able, you know, to incorporate ceramics. And I love um, advising and helping out and giving studio visits to graduate students in ceramics program. So it's very porous that way. Um, but definitely I'm at Alfred University in sculpture. And um, I'm like, what is my handle on Instagram? <laughs> it's J Quinones Art. And I think there's an underscore in there. Um, and then on my website, um, you can, I it should work. Um, but if you go Joanne Quinones, www.joannequinones.com, it'll take you to my website and it'll say Joey Quinones. I'm still working on just getting it to say Joey Quinones, but yeah, but yeah. And I follow everybody. So if you follow me, I follow you back. Cause I love seeing what people are up to. Well, thanks so much for doing this today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure. I'd like to thank Joey for coming on the show. Certainly appreciate their time. And I did want to put a plug out for the sculpture program at Alfred. You can find out more about that at alfred.edu. I wanted to take a moment and thank today's sponsors. That's the Archie Bray Foundation, Amico Brent, and the Rosenfield Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor, you can get in touch through the network website, that's brickyardnetwork.org. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you all for tuning in. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. This podcast is a production of the Brickyard Network an extension of the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. To find out more about our lineup of ceramic podcasts, visit brickyardnetwork.org.